you can't look for comfort in life. Life isn't about comfort. Life is a deadly game. It's a game of life and death. It's a game of good and evil. It's everything's on the line. Your sanity's on the line. Your, your freedom from pain is on the line. Your freedom from despair is on the line. Your family's on the line. There's no comfort. Life is an adventure. I'm a clinical psychologist, and here's one of the things you do to make people less afraid. You don't make the world safer. What you do is you, people tell you what they're afraid of, and then you break it into little bits so that they can go confront them. You know, so maybe they're afraid of going to a party and you break that down and you say, well, do you know how to introduce yourself? And they say, well, I don't, I don't really even know how to shake someone's hand. And so then you practice having them shake their hand and introduce themselves because maybe they weren't taught by that by their half-witted parents when they, were, when they were young because they were ignored. And so then you say, well, maybe you can go to a party for half an hour and all you have to do is introduce yourself to two people and we'll call that success. And you build up their confidence and their confidence one step at a time. And what happens, the... The clinical literature indicates quite clearly is you don't make people less anxious by doing that. You make them braver. It's not the same thing. You don't make the world and its horrors smaller. You make the person and their, their, their capacity to deal with horror larger. You encourage them. You strengthen them. And that's what you do at a university. You arm people with arguments. You, you hone their intellect. You, you help them learn to write so they can marshal their arguments. You, you help them learn how to engage in intellectual combat because that's better than engaging in real combat. And you, make them, you make them hard and strong. You don't mollycoddle them and make them safe unless you're their enemy, unless you're trying to devour their spirit. And that's what we have in the universities. We have, we have the reign of the Oedipal mother who's, who's answered everything is, oh, just come a little closer, dear, and I'll protect you from the world. It's just like Hansel and Gretel's, the, you know, the, the, the witch in the Hansel and Gretel story. Well, my house is made of gingerbread. Just come in here and everything will be fine. Well, she feeds you candy to fatten you up so she can eat you. That's the archetype of a modern university. In this representation, you have a representation of the individual, at least a Christian representation of the individual, and that's Christ. And it's a terrifying representation. It's a remarkable representation because it's not a representation of transcendence it's a representation of suffering and it's a funny kind of representation of suffering because the manner in which the story unfolds is this Christ as the archetypal individual the model for individuals from a psychological or mythological perspective knows that he's limited and knows that he's doomed to both suffering and death in the Garden of Gethsemane the night before his crucifixion he has an argument with God and the argument basically is uh, do I actually have to do this? And the answer is twofold. Well, no, actually, you don't have to accept your suffering. But you don't have to voluntarily accept your suffering, but there are consequences if you don't. Now, the Christian story is predicated on the idea that if you voluntarily accept your suffering, you can simultaneously transcend it. It's a remarkable philosophy, and it's also something that we have very good support for from a psychological perspective. So, for example, if I'm treating someone who has an anxiety disorder, a panic disorder, who can't go out of their house without their heart rate elevating and without collapsing into a panic-stricken heap, without visiting the emergency ward every time their heart rate accelerates, every time they're in a subway or every time they're in a mall, so they're so terrified of existence they can't even get out of their house, the way you cure that person is by getting them to voluntarily approach the things that they're afraid of. And it turns out that physiologically, if I force you to accept a certain kind of challenge, your body will go into emergency preparation mode and you'll become stressed, and that stress will cause you physiological damage, including brain damage if it's sustained for long enough. But if I present you with the same challenge and you accept it voluntarily, your brain doesn't produce stress hormones and completely different physiological systems kick in. And what that means is that people have evolved two modes for dealing with the unknown. One is voluntary approach, and the other is panic-stricken paralysis and flight. If you're agoraphobic and you can't get on an elevator, you can't get on a taxi, and you can't stand up to your husband, and I'm saying husband because most agoraphobics are women, most of them are middle-aged women, and most of them were too dependent for most of their life. So that's a monster. It's like society, husband, elevator, taxi, subway. It's a monster, and it's that place you will not go. And that's because you feel this high, and everything else looks this big.
And so, and partly that's because you've run away, and when you run away from something, it grows and chases you, which is, well, it's exactly what happens to a prey animal, man. If you go in the woods and you find a bear, especially a grizzly, well, you're in real trouble if it's a grizzly, but if it's a black bear, you know, generally speaking, if you stand your ground and make a hell of a lot of noise, that thing will leave you alone. But if you run, well, what's it supposed to think? It eats things that run from it. So that's exactly where that idea came to come from. You turn tail and run, and then the thing that you're afraid of is really a monster, and it's gonna, like, get you and eat you. It's like, well, that's true psychologically as well. What are you afraid of? Well, okay, you're afraid of everything. Well, let's get something specific you're afraid of. Well, I'm afraid of an elevator. Okay, an elevator. So I have a client, she's afraid of elevators. The elevator door opens, she goes, that's a tomb. And I thought, oh, wow, I thought it was an elevator. But for you, it's not a bloody elevator, it's death. And so that's what you're afraid of. It's worse than that, you're afraid of being trapped inside there in the dark, alone, alone, not knowing if anyone is going to rescue you, stuck there with your damn imagination, freaking out. It's like, and if that's not, and then maybe you have a heart attack because you're so terrified and you die. So, well, what can you handle? Can you go and look at an elevator from 10 feet away? It's like, yes, okay. How about nine feet away? Yes, five feet, yes, four feet, no. Okay, no problem, four and a half feet. We're gonna go from that elevator. And we're gonna look at the damn thing until you're bored of it. Because that's what we're trying to, you should be bored of the elevator. Because then you're not afraid of it, obviously. It's like, it's an elevator. You just don't notice it, right? So, this week they're four and a half feet from the elevator. Next week they're a foot from the elevator. And the week after that, the horrible gates of hell open and they look inside and they don't run. And so, hey, they're tougher than they thought they were. And that's what you're teaching them, actually. You're not teaching them that the world isn't dangerous. Because that's a stupid thing to teach someone. Bloody right the world is dangerous. It's terrifying. And sometimes people under, they realize that, and the veil lifts, and they see horror everywhere, they see that. And then they think, well, I'm just a little rabbit, I'm over here in the corner, I can't move, I'm, I'm petrified. And then they can't move, they hide at home, they cower at home, because everything has become a predatory domain. And so what you teach them is, you're not as much of a rabbit as you think. And part of that is that you help them grow some teeth so that they can go home and have that fight with their husband that they should have had 25 years ago. And it happens very frequently. If you look at a Medusa, as you probably already know, you turn to stone. The reason you turn to stone is because when you look upon nature or chaos without your normal veils, it paralyzes you physiologically. Just like a prey animal like a rabbit is terrified if it sees a wolf. If you're in the presence of something that violates your assumptions of safety, you'll freeze. You freeze so that the thing that might eat you can't see you. And that's what turns you to stone. That's nature and its terrible aspect. And the terrible aspect of nature can freeze everyone. And you can be sure, and will be seldom taught, that you will encounter that at some point in your life. It means that the things that terrify you contain things of value. The way that you live properly so that you can withstand the nature of your own being is to pick up a load that's heavy enough so that if you carry it, you have some self-respect. That's a very weird idea because it's frequently the case that people do everything they can to lighten their load. But the problem with carrying a light load is that then you have nothing that's useful to do. And if you have nothing useful to do, all you have around you, unless you're extremely fortunate, and that will only be the case for very short periods of time, is meaningless suffering. And there's nothing worse for your soul than meaningless suffering. If you look around, you see the people that you respect. And, and I don't mean that you think about respecting. I mean the ones that your gut, your whole being, your embodied being tells you to respect. You'll see that it's always people who picked up something heavy and are carrying it successfully. You think, now that's what it means to be a human being. And when you see that, you can think, well, perhaps life is worthwhile, despite the fact that the essential nature of reality is suffering.